Oh, it always seems like we get one thing right. Okay, I think we have audio. Thanks for everybody who stuck around. If you're watching this on a replay, I hope you've been able to fast forward through a bunch of this because it's been crazy. It's still Friday afternoon. Here we are in Des Moines, Iowa. The weather's getting warmer. The snow's starting to get a little slushy outside and we all have a little bit of spring fever. So I wanted to start off today's Friday live broadcast by showing off my setup gauge that I had built, uh, started building a couple of weeks ago and showed you. Uh, it's gonna be in a plan in an upcoming issue of Woodsmith Magazine. Uh, it was a pretty cool idea. It takes a regular six inch rule and holds it in place with a rare earth magnet. And you can use it for setting up the blade height or bit height or fence settings for your table saw, router table, drill press, lots of kind of tools that you can use it for. I made mine out of Wenge. I had some Wenge left over, and frankly, I've been really interested in using Wenge a lot. It's got a really nice color and grain pattern to it, and I jazzed it up with some aluminum accents on the side and on the bottom, and then got a stainless steel knob just to give that, uh, that silver and black look to it. Next thing we want to do is we got a viewer question about the TV show, so Logan's going to read that one off. I have almost recovered my breath from running to fine batteries. Yeah, so nice job. Yeah, hey, you know, I gotta get my car in for the year, right? <laughs> All right, so we have a uh, viewer comment from Terry. Uh, and Terry caught our, what would have been first episode last what was season? The first episode. Yeah, so uh, season 12 of the Woodsmith Shop uh, TV show on PBS. Uh, the first episode we did in uh, season 12 was setting up shop. Right. Where uh, you, Chris, and I talked about setting up shop and stuff that somebody should probably uh, consider when they are setting up shop. Tools, dust collection, you know, basically everything you have to think about when you're setting up shop. So, uh, a little bit of feedback from Terry. Uh, Terry said, hi, during a recent show about setting up the basic shop, the panel talked about dust control and almost like every other wood show gave a superficial rendering. Hmm. Uh, a shop, vac, and even a paper mask is not sufficient. Uh, then he goes to link a um, OSHA link on wood dust and dust control and said the smaller the particle, the greater the long-term hazard. Two microns is still dangerous uh, and to kind of circumvent some of this basically uh, even though uh, commercial dust uh, collection cannot grab that small particle. So he says, you know, look, an OSHA 95, NN95 respirator is minimum that should be worn all time and he basically wraps it up by saying uh, you know, we're giving the viewers that impression that wood dust is anything less than lethal is a threat and a misdirection for which they could be held legally responsible and certainly, certainly ethically delinquent. Best, Terry. You know, I love having the really nice comments come in about how they love the show and it inspires people to do woodworking. But I also think Terry brings a fair point. The problem is here is in a 26 minute show format, we only have a certain amount of time. And when we're trying to talk about setting up shop, we can only cover a few of the things and we can only give them a, an overview. So dust collection, I think probably deserves its own episode and it's something we can look forward to. I'm not trying to say that that's a cop-out answer, uh, even though it might come across that way, but I think Terry does raise some fair points. Um, what I'm trying to do in the TV show, though, is get people interested in woodworking. Because I think it's a fun hobby, it's enjoyable to make things uh, as gifts for other people, for your own home, as a way to build your own skills. So what I want to do is balance the enthusiasm of woodworking with also some of the safety things that go on. Whether it's, you know, using the router table or table saw safely, or talking about wood dust. The last thing that I want to do is, these are all the ways that you can die in a wood shop, join us. So what I would like to do is uh, offer some correction to what Terry says and say that, yes, I think um, it's a good idea to take wood dust seriously. We've done that in a couple of our woodworking essentials videos where we talked about dust control and uh, proper respirator safety and I think it is a good idea. I don't think we tried to come across that we were using just a paper mask on there. We were using an N95 or an N99 mask that we were talking about when you're creating a lot of dust in the shop. Uh, Terry in his note also talked about changing the air in your shop regularly so that you have those fine particles that can get swept outside 
um, especially if your shop's out in a garage or something like that. So uh, I do think that there are shop vacs out there where you can get the HEPA filters for them that do a pretty good job of removing a lot of the fine dust. Yes, you do need to pay attention to all kinds of safety in the shop. Uh, you can get hurt using hand tools, power tools, and you could be you need to be mindful of what uh, wood dust can do for you. So, but that being said, I don't want it to come across as before you start woodworking, buy three thousand dollars worth of dust control and then start building something. I would rather people start building something and then work on the tooling that they think that they need, including dust control. So I think we're going to kick over to Logan here, and he's going to talk about his table that he's been working on, and then we'll keep going. Yeah, so first of all, Becky just handed me uh, her phone. I'm assuming this is her phone. She said, uh, Larry Hensley uh, said, really like the table your jig is sitting on. Did you make it in a show? Well, Larry, let me tell you about this table. Uh, there's your phone back, Becky. Um, so basically, let's you know, talk about dust. Let's push our shop vac dust collection for our sanders out of the way quick um, and take a look at this table. So this table is a, uh, a project I'm working on um, for a friend of mine um, and it is basically a farmhouse table. Uh, it is, you know, we've, we've showed it the last couple lives maybe. Um, it's been in here for a long time. <laughs> so it, it is a uh, uh, four turned legs that I bought uh, that are hard maple, and then we have some hard maple stretchers down here. Um, the base is going to be painted, hopefully this weekend. I'm hoping to get this out of here this weekend. And then the top is a uh, solid inch and three-eighth red oak. Um, so one thing I wanted to uh, show you guys a little bit and talk about is you can see that I have the, the top clamped down. I have it clamped on both ends and on the sides. And that's because this top is developed after I glued it up a little bit of a cup. Um, and the cup is actually in a convex shape right now. So this line right here is the high point. Uh, these are lower. Um, so right now I'm pulling this down tight to the aprons. And it pulls out, it pulls out nice and flat, which is uh, really nice to see. Um, but one thing I want to talk about quick is wood movement. You know, um, with a solid wood top like this, as the season changes depending on where you're at. So here in Iowa, uh, where this table is going to live, you know, we range anywhere from negative. Well, we would reach down to this year negative forty, something like that. Yeah, we'll and we'll we'll get up above hundred degrees with a lot of humidity. So this table is going to this table top in particular is going to expand and contract. Okay, and to take care of that and to mask some of it. Now I could have I could have glued all of these boards up. There's five boards here. I could have glued these up and left this end grain down here, um, but in a traditional table construction, you'd have a breadboard end, which is what these guys are. And you can see this breadboard end is running uh, perpendicular to the rest of the table. And that's because there is a wide tenon in here uh, that meets into a groove that's in the breadboard end. And what it does is that basically locks the table in a flat state. So over the years, as this thing expands and contracts, you know, kids beating up on it, it spills on it, it's not going to want to cup. The problem is, wood doesn't expand into length, right? It only expands in width. So this breadboard end, when I build it, because it's winter here, it's supposed to be spring. I guess technically it is spring now, isn't it? It's not, John Chicken said no. Uh, technically it is spring here, but it's still cold out. It's 30 degrees, um, so that it's really dry. So right now, this top, I'm expecting to be as narrow as it will probably ever be. So I left the breadboard ends about an eighth inch long on each end. So right now these are sticking over the edge a little bit. And what I'm expecting to happen is when summer hits, this top is going to grow, right? It's going to get a little wider and hopefully it's going to meet up perfectly on the ends of the breadboard ends. Um, but in addition to that, we also have to take into account the movement across the table, right? If we, if I secure this down with a screw here and a screw on the other side, I'm limiting the top from moving and it's going to cause it to crack. It's going to cause either the top to crack, it's going to cause the stretchers to bow out, something like that. Uh, so to install that, I am going to drive one screw up through the center uh, or up through the apron to the center of the top. And then each corner is going to get these little Z clips and these guys, will be screwed to the bottom side of the top and this little tongue here 
will go into the stretcher and I'll cut a slot into the stretcher with a biscuit joiner and that's going to allow the top to move and expand in and out as the humidity season changes. So hopefully, well hopefully next week this isn't here. I'm hoping to have this uh, all done and delivered um, hopefully this weekend, uh, depending on whether it's still out of rain. So probably not going to put it in my truck to deliver it. But Steph wants to know if you weighed it. If I what? Weighed it. Uh, it is heavy. Um, I did a calculation on it. And it came up to about 300 pounds. I don't think it's actually 300 pounds. Uh, I would say it's probably 270. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty monstrous. So the top is heavy by itself. I have, uh, I have flipped the top over a few times uh, on my lonesome while I was here on the weekends. So one other thing I wanted to show real quick, because was it last week that we got a good view of my chest? Or was that two weeks ago? It was two weeks ago, wasn't it? Yeah. So I was showing off these tools, uh, these turning tools I bought. Um, these antique guys. I finally finished up my handle on my uh, on my bigger one inch skew. Um, and one thing I found that was really cool, you know, it's, a lot of a lot of older tools will have a tang construction. Let's see if I can get this out here. I kind of shoved it in. The uh, tang on these guys are tapered, right? So it comes down to a point. And I think in the manufacturing process. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll heat this up and they'll burn it into the handle. That way you get a void in the handle that's the perfect size. But I had these guys sitting on my desk, actually a reader sent these in um, for a tip, and I thought, hey, that little stepped bit is like the perfect shape to make a tapered tang slot. So it just happened to work out that that was almost perfect to, to create the tapered tang slot. Um, now it does leave me a little bit of a void on the, the shoulders, um, but you know, I think because I'm going to use this, I'm not a collector and I'm not planning on selling it. I'm probably going to epoxy that guy in just so it doesn't go flying out onto the concrete at some point. So at this point, let's head over to, who are we going to? Are we going to Dylan? Sure, let's go to Dylan. Let's go to Dylan. person to say that. Um, Dylan here, project designer with Woodsmith. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, the progress I've made on the prototype for the cradle, which is an upcoming issue. I believe last week we saw a profile shot of the end here that I was kind of working out dimension and or overall look of it. I've kind of moved into the span of the entire uh, um, base or frame for the cradle itself. So I applied a stretcher, um, I cut two profile pieces for the actual cradle itself, and then I actually just placed a couple temporary um, stretches in here just to give it rigidity so I could actually see what it looked like um, when it's finally up on its fulcrum points there. So uh, the idea with doing this um, is again to just check proportions, make, things, make sure things are not um, you know, touching where they're supposed to. Again, there's movable parts on this, so there's definitely a lot of things to consider with, uh, with the design, so especially since it's... Uh, something that's going to have precious cargo in it at some point. But um, this is kind of a prime, prime example of why I do these things um, in, in the round like this. So you notice that this rocks. Again, I mentioned this is just a temporary thing just to, to see how it functions. But right now, I'm just barely missing my stretcher. You know, there's probably a 30 second of an inch there, so I will eventually want to move that down. Um, that's probably something I probably wouldn't, I would not have picked up on otherwise. I mean, you know, you can sit and stare at a computer so long, but again, I think it, this kind of lends itself to viewing stuff in the round like this. Um, at least it helps me a lot. It's a useful tool to kind of move forward and maybe uh, visualize or work things out that I wouldn't ha wouldn't, would not be able to otherwise. So um, this is kind of where I'm at right now. The sides of these I actually think are probably going to realistically get um, bent, uh, radius plywood panels that will be veneered, so they will follow this contour. Um, I'm still working out some joinery and connection points for the sides that go along with the cradle top. Um, there will be a pattern that will essentially mimic or be like pseudo slots to go across here. So there is the visual element of being able to see in the cradle from the side and not just the top. Um, there also will be a locking mechanism that will go here that will more, more than likely be spring-loaded. So if you did want it to be a static cradle, you could do that. 
Um, I was going to also show you guys, um, since there is a rod here, I, I mentioned that this was temporary. So actually what I'm doing is I have these knobs that will go into these one inch diameter mortises here on the end. So where the dowel is actually sticking through. Um, and the point of those is so that this piece, there's actually, you know, large or yeah, large keyholes here that I had drilled in with a forcer bit. This thing will actually be able to lift off and be able to be set on the ground. I'm actually going to include a couple cleats so that you can set this on the floor um, so it becomes another static or way of uh, using the cradle itself just to kind of get as much use and functionality out of the cradle as I can. Um, again, just another element to kind of diversify what I have going on. So. Um, I've got a pretty good idea of where I'm going from here. Again, it's just uh, more of uh, material selection. I got a couple mechanical things to figure out. Um, I will say too, in about a week, I think it's the 13th. Yeah, next Thursday. Next Thursday, we do have a seminar that I'll be putting on about um, design. I'll be kind of walking you guys through, um, you know, my design process and maybe you know a couple different approaches to just getting started, which is which is always the hardest part for me. So. Um, tune in for that. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to having you guys. So uh, stay tuned. I think we're now maybe going over to Mark. Hello, everyone. Okay, a few different things I'm working on this week. Let's start with Dylan's campaign chair. As you can see, I've got it all assembled this week. So over the weekend, I'll get some stain on it. What I think I'm going to use, I'm going to use a natural stain, just so it will highlight the grain of the cherry more, so that will stand out and look, look pretty nice. And I'll work on the leather, get the leather placed in there, get that all cut and ready to go. So then we'll be done with that. Um, the other thing got going on is um, a bride's chest that John built, and this is for the TV show. So if you want to follow me through here. Looking really good. There you go. Yeah, we built this um, last week on the TV show for episode four of season 13. Um, a lot of times we're building stuff quickly and kind of just throwing it together and not really worried about the finish. And so I threw this at Mark this week, said, hey, we're busy filming the next episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, yeah. You, <laughs> can you shine this turd, as they say? <laughs> So he's sanded it all, looking really good. Got the stain on there, ready to spray. Um, I think when you get that done, then Logan's working on the, we have some metal corner braces here that are gonna go on the corners and we'll add those and be ready to shoot the final beauty shots can, next week. Can we show the one thing to show everybody that we're not perfect? Can you oh, that? Yes. Really? Yeah. yeah. You're gonna go that? Actually, this, <laughs> we're gonna blame this on Chris. <laughs> He was working on the panels, <laughs> and you can see I had all the oh, pan right, beautiful, right, you know, side panels. And um, one of those is not. One of them got there. flipped, so this is the back. <laughs> Should have been on the inside of the cabinet. It got flipped. We're gonna make this the back of the cabinet. So put that against the wall, and you'll never see it, hopefully. So you, know, you I guess you could always technically veneer over it. If you had yeah, you could. Right? Yep. Yep. Uh, so. But you know, because it's the back of the it's cabinet, the back. nobody's gonna see it. It's gonna sit up against yeah. the wall. Um, I just I noticed it when uh, we were walking around before we went live, and yeah. I thought it was fun to show everybody that yeah. hey, we're not perfect. Everybody he makes mistakes. Monkeys fall from trees. Yeah. He and so so you just gotta know how to hide them. So uh, one other thing, do we want to head out to? Yeah, let's go and take a look yeah. at the finished. Oh, sure. Well, finished, finished door. door. Yeah. And there's our Becky that's running our hub. So we want to be in the talk about Mark, please. So we've got, got the glass in this week, put the stops on, so that's all ready to go. Turned out pretty nice. Yeah, I think that turned out really good. So yeah, yeah guess, while we're out here in our photo studio, let's show the, the Tanzu cabinet. Yeah. Because once you see the picture in the magazine, you will, uh, you'll think it's actually in the room, but you zoom in and all of a sudden that turns into somebody's house, even though it really isn't. So, kind of a cool inside look at, at the magazine. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's what I've got going on this week. Um, just want to put one more plug in for Dylan's seminar next week. 
when, on Thursday, March 14th at 11 o'clock Central Time. He's going to talk about how to become a better designer. We have a lot of really great designers that work here at Draftsman, and it's been really fun to see their process on how they put together projects that end up showing up in the magazine. So if you've ever wanted to know what it takes for a magazine, Woodsmith Magazine project to go from concept to completion, you want to tune in for that. It's also going to help you become a better designer. Whether you're taking just a Woodsmith project and you want to take it in a different direction or come up with your own things. The other thing is we've done quite a few seminars already and if you've missed out on those you still have the opportunity to either buy them individually or we have an all access pass where you can get all the six seminars that we did last year and all 12 for 2019. So if you go to woodsmithshop.com slash seminars, you can sign up for that all access pass. Otherwise, we'll see you again right here next Friday. If you have any questions or comments or smart remarks, you want to leave them in the notes and we'll highlight the best of them next week. Thanks everybody.